Today, I'm building a staircase with a custom handrail. But before we get to the build, let me get you up to speed about what needed to be done on the job site before we could install the stairs and handrail. Here's the before picture, which the clients felt was a dated design and was not going to go well with their new hickory flooring that they were installing at the top of the stairs. They wanted to update the style of the staircase to an open-ended tread. To do this, I needed to modify the wall. So I drew the rise and run of the staircase on the drywall. I then took my sawzall and carefully cut out the shape. Unfortunately, the treads were dated into the skirt board, so I had to demo them and cut new stringers. I only demoed half the staircase, so I'd have something to stand on while I worked on the other side. After the demo was done, the corners of the drywall were just flapping in the wind, ready to snap off with a little pressure. To solve this, I reframed the wall up in sections, then I slid them in between the stringers and drywall, nailing them off to the existing studs. But before I demoed anything, I fabricated all the components back at the shop. While I could order custom sized treads, the millwork shops in my area didn't offer the customizations I needed to wrap around the existing walls, so I just fabricated my own. For the treads themselves, it was your basic milling to thickness and gluing together operation. But for the nosing, I milled up some 8 quarter stock and chucked a stair nose bit in the router. Before I ran the stock through the router, I clipped off the corners at the table saw. This helped reduce the load of the router, especially using a huge nosing bit. It also considerably reduced the chatter and tear out on the hickory, which is prone to having a lot of tear out when routing. Then at the router table, I used several feather boards to help keep the stock tight to the fence and tight to the table. This resulted in a perfect bull nose that needed very little sanding. Once all the pieces were bull nosed, I cut the miters for the open ended treads on the table saw. For most of the treads, it was your basic edge banding operation with mitered corners, but for the bottom tread I had to make a notch for the newel post. I first attached the center nosing with dominoes and glue. I then went back to the table saw, and for safety I cut a miter on a longer piece of nosing and then cut the piece to length. I pre-glued the mitered corner before attaching it to the tread. This made assembly a bit easier, so all I had to do was tack the return in place with some brads. I milled the test block the same width as the newel post and did a quick test fit to be sure I had a nice fit. It's much easier to adjust the edge banding before the glue fully sets. Now on to making the newel posts. I ripped down some 8 quarter stock and laminated two pieces together. Once the glue was dry I ran it through the planer until it was down to the thickness I needed. To give the newel posts the illusion that they have floating panels, I milled up some stock and ripped a miter down one edge. I set up a stop block on the table saw so I could quickly cut the ball to the same length. Then I glued the miters together to create the corners for the newel post. These were long and skinny, too skinny to clamp so I used some blue tape to hold them together while the glue dried. Once the glue had set up enough to take the tape off, I used a card scraper to remove the excess glue squeeze out so the corners would fit tight to the post. Before installing the corners, I pre-finished the posts themselves. This would be a lot easier before the corners are installed and also help prevent any raw wood from showing along the edges if the wood shrank during seasonal movement. Then as an extra precaution, I ran my block plane down the sides chamfering the corners to be sure the corner trim would sit tight to the post. To install the trim, I used a headless pin nailer. It was big enough to hold the trim in place, but small enough not to have to putty a bunch of holes. There are three rail elements to the post. One at the bottom, one two-thirds up, and one at the top. This design element came from the doors in the rest of the house that had the same panel design. I started out by marking and cutting each piece as I worked my way around and up the post. When installing the middle rail, I used a spacer block to be sure they would all be placed in the same spot, and to save a bunch of time not having to measure for each one. The last detail for the new post was to build the cap. 
There were a few test cuts involved and a bit of math to get all four sides to meet in the middle at a nice clean point. I didn't record it because at the time I thought it would make for a boring video. If there are enough people interested, maybe I'll go back and recreate a video for the future. But the operation itself is pretty straightforward. I used my shop made vertical sled to clamp the workpiece and with the blade raised to the correct height and angle I made the cuts. I cut the cross grain first it is more likely to tear out and then I cut with the grain second removing any tear out from the cross grain cut. I reset the saw blade to 90 and then cut the decorative shoulders. On the job site the cap will be pinned in place with a brad nailer and a little glue and the underside will be trimmed out with some cord around. I did the same order of operations here. I cut the cross grain first and then I cut with the grain to cut off any tear out that may have happened. While the stain and finish was drying on the newel posts, I moved on to prepping the stock for the spindles. I jointed, planed, and cut each spindle square. There are 20 spindles in this project, plus some extra stock to create the little cross braces between each spindle. So this took some time. Next was to cut the little angled cross braces that were going between the spindles. Since my table saw is old school and doesn't have a proper riving knife, I clamped a shim just so it rubbed the back side of the blade. This way, as I cut the little parts, they were pushed away from the blade, preventing them from becoming little kickback bullets. A stop block clamp to the miter gauge made the cuts accurate and quickly repeatable. While well, I had the miter gauge set up at the right angle, I cut the tops of all the spindles. This angle is going to go against the handrail. Then I re-squared the miter gauge to cut the lower cross braces that are going between the spindles. I set up a stop to make the cuts repeatable, but I took it one step further. I set the red arm as the stop so the metal bar would act as a hold down. This made it a little safer and more comfortable to cut the little parts. Now it's time to cut the joinery. I know a lot of people poo-poo the domino because they think it's not real woodworking or it costs too much or they just love to hate something. But for a small custom shop like mine, when I need to get a job finished before the next mortgage payment is due, the domino is the way to go. There was 72 of these little cross braces, so I think the domino paid for itself that day. To set up my jig, I screwed it down to the table and set up some angled stop blocks to hold the workpiece in place, and a stop block to my right to register the domino against. This way the mortises would all be in the same place. For the spindles themselves, I reset my jig so I'd have something to clamp to. Then I set a stop block to the left and right to register for both the upper and lower cross braces. Then for the very bottom cross braces, I reconfigured the jig one last time to cut the mortises on both sides. You may have noticed that these parts are stained and finished. I wanted to pre-finish the inside edges before assembling them, as it would be really difficult to stain and finish after they were assembled. To assemble the spindle units, I screwed yet another jig to the table. The stop block at the top of the jig is cut at the same angle as the rise and run of the stairs to help me quickly align all the parts at the proper angle. Now all there's left is to add dominoes, clamps, and glue. I clamped it in a way so I could simply lift the assembly off the jig, set it aside, and start clamping up the next set. To attach the symbols to the treads, I simply doweled them. So once the assembly was dry, I routed out a slot in the bottom of the spindles to receive the dowel. To do this, I screwed a jig to the side of my assembly table to clamp the spindle assembly upside down so I could route out an oblong hole in the bottom of each spindle. The reason for the oblong hole is it gave me a little wiggle room in case one of the dowels in the treads was off. Once the glue is set, all three dowels would be solid. 
The reason why I'm blowing out the hole there is my spiral up cut bit was so dull it made more smoke than sawdust, so I'm using a spiral down cut just to get the job done, and it is driving the chips to the bottom of the hole. I should also mention that a big chunk of walnut scrap is only there to take up the extra space in the clamps. This makes it easier to clamp the workpiece without the bar sticking out in the way. Once everything was installed, I had one more detail to take care of, and that was the cove on the back side of the treads and risers. My local mill workshop did not stock cove and hickory, and they charged a $200 setup fee for custom run. I only needed a few sticks, so I was back at the shop to mill some up. Since hickory is a splintery wood and a router will often tear out a big chunk of wood instead of cut it, I did a similar operation as the stair nozzle. To prevent tear out and reduce the load on the router, I used a dado blade to remove the bulk of the material. Then set up feather boards on the router table to route out the cove. Since thin pieces will chatter when milled, I used a wider piece of wood than I needed to make the cove. I then ripped the cove free at the table saw. This lets the router cut a cleaner cove and is much safer to waste a little wood than to try to route a little piece. I should mention for the handrail profile, I did have my local mill workshop custom cut it. That was large enough and complicated enough to justify a custom run over my labor to mill it in-house. So here are some shots of the finished staircase and handrail. If you're going to take on a project like this, I highly recommend you pick up a code book. In my 20 plus years of working in the trades, I've had all kinds of people tell me what the building codes are, and more often than not, they are wrong to one degree or another. You'll save yourself all kinds of headaches if you get your information from the source.